Praise the Lord. Um, good to see you folks. Good to pinch hit for PJ. Um, as Asher said, he's on a love trip. <laughs> I, I don't know where this boy comes up with some of this stuff. But um, that's fine. That's fine. Um, we're going to look at the triumphal entry this morning. Um, it's recorded in all four Gospels. I'm not going to read it out of all four Gospels. Um, but we will be turning to a couple choice verses because each eyewitness account is just a tad different. And I'd like to underscore those differences for you this morning. But before we do that, I'd like to set some background, if I could. Um, I'm going to be drawing my source, sources from a, uh, a podcast I've been listening to called Bema, um, a converted Jewish scholar by the name of uh, uh, Marty Solomon. I don't know, some of you may follow that. I find it absolutely intriguing to look at the Jewish perspective of some of this stuff. I'm going to be throwing some of that stuff in there this morning and some other facts that we found uh, that are not necessarily biblical, but um, they are very, very plausible as we look at this whole scheme this morning. So let's just bow our hearts in a word of prayer, ask for the Lord's divine blessing upon um, our time together this morning. Lord Jesus, we count it all joy to be with those of the like precious faith in the house of the Lord this morning. We know that there is a special blessing for those that gather. So Lord, touch your people today. Quicken their hearts. Open our minds to receive the engrafted word that is able to transform our souls. Take the blinders from our eyes. Let us see clearly the word that you have for us today and bless your people. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen and amen. We do want to give a shout out to those who are watching via the internet. Thank you for inviting us into your home. And we trust that this indeed is a blessing to you also. I've entitled this message, East Side or West Side. Um, and I think once you, once we get going here, you'll see what what it is I'm endeavoring to do. I'd like to submit to you a a plausible theory. Now, when I say plausible, that means, eh, you know, it's it's probably a pretty good shot. Something like this happened. We just don't know all the intricate details to it. An idea that's well. I think it's worth thinking about, something that may have validity. We do know that Pontius Pilate, a Roman appointee, was the governor of Judah during the celebration of Passover, or this time when Jesus uh, came into Jerusalem. <clears throat> we also know that the Passover was Israel's Independence Day celebration. Um, they were freed from a superpower called Egypt. We also know that Jerusalem was a notorious place where insurrections and rebellions took place on a regular basis. <clears throat> they were looking to overthrow Roman rule. Does the name Barabbas trigger anything in your heart and mind? I found an interesting historical, I call them nuggets. Not a biblical account, but a reference that claims that Pontius Pilate, his residence was in Caesarea. Now, Ces not Caesarea Philippi, but the other Caesarea, which is just off the Mediterranean coast. It was a city that was built by Herod the Great, and they're still determining how he poured underwater cement columns. <laughs> Maybe we'll have to ask him when we get there. But uh, 
interesting. It's about 55 miles northwest, northwest of Jerusalem, about an hour and 45 minutes by bus. Some well-known scholars think that Pilate, knowing that the celebration in Jerusalem could get a little dicey, it might get out of order, he chose to make his presence felt. So the big cheese traveled to Jerusalem just to keep a lid on the party. We know he was there because later on, he condemns Jesus to be crucified. Now, I'm sure he didn't take the bus. In order for him to get there, he would have had to travel down the seacoast to the city of Joppa, up through the mountains of Joppa into the city of Jerusalem, and he would have entered on the west side. Okay? Jesus was traveling from Jericho, and he would have traveled up to Jerusalem and entered on the east side. So we have Herod coming in on the west side and Jesus on the east side. And my question is, could it be that the two of them entered at the same time? Speculation. We don't know, but it's an interesting thought to ponder. I don't have any biblical authority to base that assumption, but we do know that both of them were there. Interesting that we have Pilate entering from the West with power, authority, clout, sword, and Jesus, on the other hand, entering the East Side with humility, forgiveness, grace, and truth. Pilate's intention is to intimidate all with overwhelming force. Jesus' intention is to invite all with overwhelming love. Pilate governs with a rod of iron. Jesus governs with a towel of servitude. Pilate resides in Herod's palace. Jesus has no place to even lay his head. Kind of get the picture here? Okay. You can see the paradox. A tale of two kingdoms on display. The clash of kingdoms in Jerusalem right before our very eyes. A head-on collision, if you will, between two opposing kingdoms. Now, the first kingdom is an earthly, visible kingdom that provides physical security to its subjects from other nations, stomping out any and every external threat, the kingdom is wrong. Israel's appointed governor, Pontius Pilate. Now the second kingdom, a spiritual kingdom, invisible kingdom, that provides lasting peace and freedom from sin. That is, internal threats from within and invisible forces of darkness from without. The kingdom of God, who is governed by none other than the Son of God, Jesus. A stark difference between the two. One kingdom governed by force and coercion, the other kingdom governed by truth and grace. Now, the event or events of Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem are recorded in all four eyewitness gospel accounts. Each one is true, but each witness sees details just a little bit different than the other. Obvious differences show us that John's account is the shortest, only eight verses, and the only version that connects the resurrection of Lazarus as partially responsible for the crowds. Of course, we cannot overlook the fact that Jews were indeed gathering to celebrate their Independence Day. Luke's account, the longest, 16 verses, and the only version that details Jesus weeping over Jerusalem on his approach is interesting. 
Mark's account is only 11 verses long and details that Jesus arrived in Jerusalem late in the day made some careful observations in the temple, and then backtracked a bit with his disciples to stay in Bethany. Matthew's account, also 11 verses long, details that upon his arrival, Jesus stirred the whole city. And they asked this question, Who is this? The details make for an interesting study and tell us different stories, and a good student, investigator, will examine all the evidence to piece together exactly what happened, and although we need to be thorough in our analysis and detailed in our observations, we cannot overlook the forest for the trees. There are teachings that are buried here that the disciples put their own purpose that we need to uncover and applications we need to make in order to continue our walk of faith with the Lord and to fulfill our high calling to God and the nations. So what, it is, what is it we can discover from these different details and how can we apply them to our walk with the Lord? Good question. Point number one this morning I'd like to make is found in Matthew 21, Matthew 21, verses 10 and verse 11. It says the entire city, and I'm, this is the New Living Translation, I believe, that I'm reading from. Not sure why I didn't put that in my notes, but I didn't. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. Now, that's the first thing you don't want to have when you're under Roman occupation, is an uproar. As he entered, who is this, they asked, as if they didn't know him? Interesting. And the crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The question, who is this, is rather interesting to me. <clears throat> there was a lot of people there. There was a lot of people that knew him personally, intimately. There was a lot of people that knew him begrudgingly. And there was people there that knew him casually. There are the three things I'm going to look at this morning. First of all, those who knew him personally. When I think of the crowds that knew him personally, the first thing that comes to my mind is his disciples. They were taught to imitate the things he did. They were called to be like their master. They were chosen to make a difference, not only in their own nation, but also among the Gentile nations. Matthew was writing to a mixed audience. Therefore, the question, who is this? The only people that could really answer it accurately were the disciples. Peter identifies him later on as the Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon that confession in Matthew 8 or Matthew 16, we feel like that upon Peter's confession, the church of Jesus was built. I'll touch on that someday. There's some real interesting information about that. Um, this was revealed to him through the power of the Holy Spirit. Flesh, Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, Peter, but my Father in heaven has planted that thought in your heart. Thank the Lord for that. Then there was the confession of Thomas after he was raised from the dead. And I'm sure all of you recall, recall that story when I'm not going to believe unless I see him. And Jesus appears to him in a closed room and, hey, Thomas, come here. <laughs> you, you, you see these hands of mine? Put your finger in my, really? My Lord, my God, was his response. Clearly touching the idea of who he is. Another interesting question we come face to face with is, 
when the disciples were caught in a boat in a storm and Jesus comes to them and he calms the storm. And they respond, who is this man? It was a good question. The response, even the winds and the waves obey him. You see, their personal knowledge of Jesus led them to do specific acts as they followed him. And that's the way it needs to be with us. Once we get to know him personally and individually, our acts will follow. Why? Because we know who he is. Secondly, there are those who knew him begrudgingly. You know, Jesus wasn't appreciated by all. There were a group of corrupt high priests called Sadducees who directed the temple worship during this time. They had a very different opinion of him. They were terribly threatened by all the miracles that he did. They were threatened by his teachings, insulted, to say the least. And these healings were just driving them crazy. Who is this rabbi, Jesus? They were more focused on his pedigree and lineage than on the spirit of the message he proclaimed. They insisted that he was illegitimate, therefore incapable of serving as a rabbi. They either missed the fact of his, mar his miraculous birth, or they chose to willfully ignore it in order to protect their crime syndicate. They postured constantly, trying to lure him into a trap, unsuccessful for the most part, in order to condemn him to death. But their conniving, consistent, persuasive pers uh, persistence, <laughs> it eventually prevailed, and they found a way to have him crucified by a third party. I am convinced that these men knew who he was. But their knowledge, albeit inaccurate and misguided, led them to follow him and to take appropriate actions of their own according to their own worldview. Thirdly, I see those who knew him Casually. There were others who knew, knew Jesus simply out of curiosity. They had heard of his feats. They may have even listened to him teach on the hillsides or in the synagogues. Some of them may have, an, may have even eaten of the bread and the fish that he multiplied on two different occasions but they held him at arm's length. They were curious, but they wouldn't let him get close because they didn't want to make a commitment to follow him. They knew it would cost them their way of life, so they held Jesus at a distance, never getting close enough to him for him to call them by name. Their fear led them to follow him casually at a safe distance. Their knowledge of him led them to follow at a safe distance, casually, and not get involved. Now, let me just put a little bow on that. The real question today is, how do you follow him? How do I follow him? Personally? Intimately, begrudgingly, curiously, casually. I'm convinced we will all fall into one or more of these categories. And then the question becomes, what actions are guiding my knowledge of Jesus? 
Am I a true disciple of Jesus or a begrudged distractor following my own personal agenda? Or am I a true disciple of Jesus or a casual listener who follows at a distance? I mean, only we personally can answer those things. Let me take you to question number two, found in Mark 11, 11. Mark 11, 11. So Jesus came to Jerusalem and went into the temple after looking, watch, watch this, after looking around carefully at everything. That's, that's just draws my attention. He left because it was late in the afternoon then he returned to Bethany with his 12 disciples. And the question is, for what reason did he go into the temple, and why did he check everything out so carefully? Well, let me see if I can answer that. Probably to see if it was as bad as he thought, bad as he had heard. I'm speculating here, but I've seen this before. I'm thinking that the money changers' tables and the animal cages where the sacrifices were were all covered with cloth. Now, when we lived down in South America, we went once a week to the feria, to the mercado. That was just a big open-air food market. And when they were done, they would just cover the fruits and the vegetables and leave them there for another day. I'm thinking they also had, <laughs> they, they covered their money boxes and everything, just, just left it there. Now, it was guarded. They, <laughs> they had people watching it. But uh, I'm thinking that seems like a reasonable way they would have done this here. But Scripture says the day was well spent. Sun was so slowly sinking into the west. It was quiet. The money changers had gone home. The shop was closed up for the day. The only thing that was there was the smell of the animals. You see, the sacrifices they sold to the Gentile worship, that, that was legitimate. There was, I mean, that's, that was necessary. But it was the way they did it. That clearly frustrated the Lord Jesus. They had converted the outer court, the court where the Gentiles were to worship the Lord, into a large, convenient mercado, market, feria. And I'm sure he noticed the inflated price tags that were hanging on the cages for the sacrifices. It was true that the traveling Jews and Gentiles needed to exchange their Roman currency for temple currency so as not to corrupt the temple. But they saw no connection in converting the outer worship court, the court of the Gentiles, into a market. And I'm sure after carefully looking around and observing everything, there was a slow fire brewing in the heart of our Savior. This place was consecrated years ago for other activities, and Jesus began quietly planning his activities for the next day. Why did he check things out? Point number two. I think he did that to put on notice the demonic strongholds that were orchestrating the ruling priests. You see, there was a spiritual storm brewing, a clash between two opposing titans, the kingdom of love and light and the kingdom of fear and darkness. The presence of Jesus just put on notice to the invisible forces of Satan that he was there. You see, the enemy had already marked his territory, and that's what demons do. 
We face some of that in Ecuador. Demonic spirits, demons are territorial. Jesus, the Son of God, had left his scent, if I could say that, that the demons knew well. They knew who he was, and they knew what he had come to do. The demons could sense his presence. They knew a confrontation was coming. They became unsettled, jittery, and all for good reason. This place had been, as I had said before, consecrated to the Lord of heaven and earth hundreds of years ago, and that covenant was still in effect. The problem is that the religious leaders had fallen asleep at the switch. They were duped by doctrines of demons and convinced that this young rabbi, this young quote-unquote rebel rabbi, was a wolf in sheep's clothing. So, ladies and gentlemen, let us not make the same mistake. Our Savior rose victorious from the grave. Hallelujah. Question number three comes from Luke's gospel, and I'm looking at Luke 19, 41 through 44. Okay? Again, this is all in connection with the entrance into Jerusalem. But as he came closer to Jerusalem, he saw the city ahead. He began to weep. How I wish today that you, of all people, his Jewish friends, You of all people would understand the way of peace, but now it's too late, and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in in on you from every side. They will crush you to the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Wow. Um, Why did Jesus weep over Jerusalem? Well, let me just for a moment define that word weep. This is not the idea of shedding a tear or two. This word is understood as an uncontrollable, deep, profound sob. And I don't know if any of you have ever been there. In our grief study classes, um, We have had some people testify to some of the grief that they have gone through. It just shows up at some unexpected moment, and it's profound. It's uncontrollable. It just appears to be what the writer is saying here with Jesus. You think, what was it that caused him to respond in that way. Well, I think we we have it clearly spelled out in the Scriptures here for us. In verse 42a, it says, How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. I hate to say this, and and I, I see it happening all the time, But there are those of us who pick and choose choice portions of Scripture to twist and to prove our preconceived erroneous ideas and thoughts. That sounds, wow, it was a mouthful, Pastor Doug. (laughs) Well, yeah, it was. You say, well, how could that ever happen? Well, we see Satan clearly, he, he... applies the same tactic when he tempted Jesus in Matthew 4. When he took him up to the pinnacle, 
and said, well, throw yourself down. Really? He quotes scriptures out of context because he wants it to suit his own personal agenda. Now, we don't do that, do we? <laughs> I certainly hope not. And he, he quotes scripture. This is Satan. He will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. <laughs> well, Satan, if you think this is such a good idea, why don't you do it? <laughs> um, and Jesus responds with Scripture also saying, you shall not test the Lord your God foolishly. Well, you say to me, Pastor Doug, how is it they, that they did not fully understand? They, they clearly saw the part of Jesus entering Jerusalem riding on a donkey. That was why they were waving the palm branches. And by the way, from some of my studies, I understand that that was a capital offense punishable by um, taking your head off. When you were proclaiming someone else's king in the Roman Empire. That was a dangerous proposition. But they felt like this was the time. This was the time when Jesus, their Messiah, their king, was going to put an end to Roman domination. And they clearly saw it from Scripture. Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice, O people of Zion! Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem! Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey. Riding on a donkey's colt. No, I mean, that doesn't get you fired up. You know, I don't know what will. But their hearts were fixed on a king liberating them from Rome. They were expecting Jesus to free them from Roman domination. And they missed the spirit of the word. They missed the second part of that portion of Scripture in Zechariah 9.10, which says, I will remove the battle chariots from Israel and the war horses from Jerusalem. I will destroy all the weapons used in, the, in battle. And your king will bring peace to the nations. His realm will stretch from sea to sea and from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. Jesus was bringing a different kingdom. Different priorities, different values. Their glasses clouded their view. Their short-sightedness would not allow them to see the fuller picture God was painting. Oh, they were the chosen instruments of God to bless the nations of the world. They were God's hope to take his gospel to the ends of the earth. But short-sightedness sets in motion a series of events that simply cannot be stopped. Jesus said to him here in verse 43 and verse 44, You're, it's too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. He said in 43 and 44, Before long your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you to the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place. We know that happened. We know that happened. That's why Jesus weeps. That's why he weeps. He knows that divine judgment will fall upon his beloved people. You see, you cannot force people to change. As much as I'd like to stand up, here I need to repent, you know, I well, I mean, I can tell you, but I can't make you do it. I'm not going to hold a gun to your head and say, repent or else. <laughs> that would be rather ludicrous, you know. 
But you can't force people to change. I mean, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Now, Jesus, he put all the salt in their food that he could, but they still refused to drink from the springs of living water. So, pursue the Lord with a whole heart. Finally, now, well, I'm running out of time here. Good thing the last point's coming up. A question from John in chapter 12, verses 17 through 19. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb. Wow. I almost would have liked to have seen that. <laughs> Raising him from the dead. And they were telling others about it. You see, you just, you just can't keep a good thing down. That was the reason so many went out to meet him because they had heard about this miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. So the question is obvious. Why was it that the crowds went after him? Why was it that the whole world went after Jesus? Well, because he identified with them. He identified with their humanity. Oh, yeah, the crowds may have been uneducated, fickle and unpredictable, but they always know where to find good food. <laughs> they know where the best places are located. They have a sixth sense of who is for them and who is against them? Okay? This crowd could not deny even for a moment that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. The eyewitnesses were too many. The facts were established. This was part of the crowd that ushered Jesus into Jerusalem. Uh, it's true, their motives may not have been pure. And their scriptures may not have been interpreted correctly, but no one, no one was going to tell them that this Jesus, that this man was a fake, a fraud, or an imposter. Hallelujah. Well, why did the whole world go after him? Because he was a master teacher. He was a master teacher. No one taught like him. He had authority. He had, they call it in Jewish circles, chutzpah. <laughs> he had something about him that the rest of them just didn't have. And his disciples clearly saw that. And they were becoming more and more like him all the time. I try sometimes to put my, my feet in their shoes. And, boy, I, I, I just don't like the way I feel <laughs> when, when, when I try to do that. I mean, there they are, surveying the crowd, trying to make sure that nothing's going to catch Jesus off guard. But... Don't want any disruptions with this whole thing, but there's a strange sense, an exhilarating sense of awe that they are witnessing something supernatural here. Now, there may have been a few of them that still weren't getting it, and I'm sure if I was there, I'd have been one of them. In fact, in our text in verse, nine, or verse 16 of chapter 12 of John, it states that his disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. 
But Jesus, or after Jesus entered into his glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. Therefore, even though the disciples had a slow learning curve, they eventually put it together. And so will you. So will you. Why did the whole world follow him? Well, because the, Lar the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders lacked what he had. He offered something to these dear people that those people just couldn't offer. They were sumamente frustrado, very frustrated, because Jesus was gathering large crowds, getting all kinds of attention, and gaining legitimacy. They couldn't deny Lazarus was raised by their quote-unquote rebel rabbi. Jesus. They couldn't persuade the crowds that he was an imposter. In fact, the more they tried, the more frustrating it became. And I can see them just throwing up their hands in disgust, saying, look how the whole world's going after him. Well, when you got something to offer, you have something to offer. So suit up you got something to offer this world too. Greater things than these you shall do because he's going to the Father in heaven. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. He still has something to offer each and every one of us on this Palm Sunday. Hail him as your Savior. Hail him as your Lord. Surrender completely to his kingdom and become a servant of all. Matthew's question, who is this? Mark's question, why did Jesus carefully examine everything in the temple? Luke, why did Jesus weep as he entered Jerusalem? And John, why did the whole world go after him? Good questions to meditate upon on this Palm Sunday. Hallelujah. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to slip out of here because I'm just not feeling real well. Okay? I'm going to ask Mr. Pete to come if he could close us in a word of prayer. And uh, I've had all kinds of prayers, but... Um, Mr. Reno, I will not reject prayers. Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for the word that we heard this morning. Father, we just pray that it would just basically seep into our, our spirit and we just uh, ponder it and, and remember what this whole season is about, uh, your triumphal entrance in horrible death um, just just so that we can spend eternity with with you and father we just uh pray for everybody's going and that they have good weeks coming up and again we just re remember the easter season and everything it represents so we thank you for these things in your name amen <laughs>